Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture, and our topic today is human trafficking. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And I have two very special guests today to discuss this area and the aspect of ministering in this area. We're not going to talk theoretically about human trafficking today as much as talking about how ministry uh, can be done in this area. And I have Katie uh, Pedigo with me, who's from New Friends and New Life. Uh, welcome, Katie. Thank you. And Linda Tomsack, who's actually on staff as a graphic designer here at the seminary. She works on the floor below me at the, in the Hendricks Center building, but she uh, volunteers her time in ministry uh, dealing uh, with uh, girls who have been trafficked. And so um, in the midst of our conversations over the last year, uh, this topic has come on my radar. And thanks to Linda, and so I thought it would be appropriate to have her in. So we're glad to have you, Linda. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, uh, let me let me just begin with some uh, with some information on what New Friends and New Life is all about, because it does a good job also of introducing our topic. It says New Friends and New Life serves women who have been exploited in prostitution, brothels, and clubs. Some are part of the over 300,000 women and children trafficked in America each year. That already is a surprising sentence because I think most people think that human trafficking is something that happens mostly elsewhere. Some are society's throwaways. Some are runaways. Many are enticed by supposed friendships and easy money. The sex trade in this country is quickly becoming as lucrative as the illegal drug trade. National research shows 90% of women in the industry were sexually abused as children. The average age that women begin to work in prostitution is 13 years old. While each woman in our program, we call them protégés, has a unique story, there are common threads. Single moms with literal or no support systems, childhood sexual abuse, family violence, teen pregnancy, other traumatic experiences, women who want better lives for their children but lack the tools and the skills to provide a safe and nurturing environment. Well, that's a interesting introduction to New Friends and New Life. It's the, the little lo- logo here, or motto, is transforming the lives of women and their children. And Katie, how long have you been involved with uh, New Friends and New Life, and how in the world do you get involved with something like this? Well, I've been the executive director at New Friends New Life for about three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And I started my career as an attorney. Mm -hmm. And so I say I'm a recovering attorney. (laughs) (laughs) I've I've met very few of those people. (laughs) No, go ahead. (laughs) I am going through rehabilitation as we speak. (laughs) So I practice law and um, just really always wanted to be in human rights. Mm -hmm. It always interests me. I feel like God really put that on my heart. But I wasn't sure, as you said, Mm -hmm. where in America you can do human rights law. And what kind of law, law did you practice? I did employment law and okay. contract law and business law. Okay. And so I had children and stayed home for a while. When I came back to the workforce, I wanted to be in something where I really felt my passion and my God calling. And so New Friends, New Life um, – really let me know that they needed a director with uh, that type of experience, and so it was a perfect fit. So I've been there for three and a half years, and I have been the one truly that has been blessed to be And you've been learning on the job then, that means, because you certainly didn't learn about this in law school, right? No, no. I mean, you definitely can learn some of the logic, some some strategy. You can Mm -hmm. learn, uh, again, some of the legal issues that come with governance and Mm -hmm. running a nonprofit, Mm -hmm. but certainly we're all learning together. For no. sure. Wow. And Lindo, how did you get involved in this kind of a ministry? What, what got you? So, I mean, I, you know, I think of a graphic designer mm-hmm. sitting in front of a big computer screen mm-hmm. most of the day, and that's where I see you most of the time. So, so how where, how did you get started uh, ministering in this way? Um, several years ago, just randomly heard a, a radio program on human trafficking, mm-hmm. and I'd never heard of that before, and I was just. I mean, kind of stunned. I mean, 
And I thought, if that happens to people, I have to do something. And I didn't know what to do. There wasn't much to be found Mm -hmm. at that time, much information. So I thought, well, if if I were a doctor and I were treating a disease, I would learn everything I could about it. So I just kind of started learning. And the more I learned, the more I realized that young girls were being trafficked. And um, and then I heard of a ministry called Alert. Mm -hmm. And they go into juvenile detention where a lot of girls who are actually trafficked are arrested as prostitutes and they wind up in detention and um, the uh, juvenile justice system is um, intended to rehabilitate, not to punish. And they want Christian groups to come in in and talk to their um, people that are there, the the girls and boys. So we have a ministry with the girls, and we find out a lot of kids don't even realize that they're trafficked. Um, They have a boyfriend who is actually a pimp, and they are arrested for prostitution, um, or they've been trafficked and didn't realize it. And so we are able to share with them. Um, We do a life skills class, and um, it's great. Uh, The girls are awesome, and um, just we love them, and and they love us, and it's been a blessing. So So Alert is the ministry that you work with here in Yes, I volunteer with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so so how old – I'm just curious, how old are these ministries? How old is is New Life, New Friends? New Friends, New Life has been around for coming 16 years, Uh coming this spring. And it really started with one woman, Mm -hmm. and she came and was – went to a Bible study and was surrounded by eight other women who – and she said, I'm in the sex industry and I want help. I, I want out. So this was 16 years ago before we used words like human trafficking. Was this trafficking. in Dallas? It was in Dallas. Mm. And so then her story started unfolding, and we started learning more about the abuse that she had endured and what she had experienced in her childhood. Mm. And so then she started getting help and mm. started having the hope that came from being restored. So she happened to show up in a Bible study, and that was the start of this? That was the start. Wow. That was the start. It started 16 years ago with this one one woman named Amy. Mm. And then she started getting healing and help and started inviting her friends. And so it grew from that to the one woman 16 years ago to then over 650 last year, where we're able to help women and young girls and then their children um, so that we can break the generational cycle of abuse and trauma that now, comes with that. Now, so 650 women work with the ministry, or to be sure? Right, no, so we helped 650, oh, helped yes, 650 last women. year. So okay. oh, that wow. that comes, we go into the Dawson State, or used to be Dawson State Jail, now New, Lou Starrett Jail, mm-hmm. and we work with women that are in there to get them a Bible study and let them know about resources. So when they leave prison, they know that they have opportunities outside of being trafficked. Mm-hmm. And we also help women to that come to us that want help and want mental health services and spiritual support and job training. We have a pro- program called Second Chance Jobs where we mm. put them into an internship so that they can get conventional employment. And then 82% of the women we help have children of their own, mm-hmm. and on average two children. Mm. So we have a full-fledged children's program so that we're working with them on their mental health. Oh, and wow. Because you can imagine, yeah, they've absolutely. experienced more yeah. and seen more in their little lifetimes. Right. Right. You know, that anyone should. And they've seen men coming out of their in and out of their homes, perpetrators. Mm-hmm. And so that we have a program for them where we're working on their their healing and their restoration mm. and helping them in school and with their homework and teachers. Oh, wow. And then we also go into the mm-hmm. uh, juvenile detention centers and we take in licensed professional counselors that go in and do sexual abuse recovery for those same girls, mm-hmm. 12 to 17. Yeah, because this so, is a long-term Right. transformation that we're talking about. It is. And it really stems, as you said earlier, from the early onset of abuse. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I came to work here, that was the first thing I had to wrap my head around was, mm-hmm. how can this happen? Mm-hmm. How, what could lead a woman or a girl to this place, to mm-hmm. this, uh, you know, I just couldn't understand. And I, I wanted to figure out, is it race? Is it economics? Is it the area of town that they live? What What is it that is the genesis or the nexus to this? And what we found was it's sexual abuse, early onset of abuse, where the young girl, it's something triggers there that this is what I'm made to do. Hmm. This is how my needs get met. This is how I get my attention. And they don't realize at four, five, and six that there's anything different than that. Mm-hmm. But then as they start going to school and they get older, they realize 
I, I am different. This isn't happening to every little girl mm-hmm. that's around me. And then they want to escape that. Well, that's when we get the runaways or the throwaways in our cities. So that's why when you say the average age is 13, that's the age they want to run. Mm -hmm. They want to escape that abuse in their home. And so that's where we're targeting them. I love the ministry that Alert does and and putting volunteers in to really mentor them and Mm -hmm. to care for them. And then for New Friends New Life to bring in the licensed professional counselors who really work therapeutically to restore from that sexual abuse. So the difference between these two ministries is, is that you all really provide kind of the support and logistics necessary to help the person transform transfer out of where they've been to hopefully landing in a better place and alert is helping by providing volunteer and just person power and care and that kind mm-hmm. of thing to uh, uh, bring support personal support beyond professional support to the to the girls, is that is that right? Well, you, actually, Alert works with both boys and girls. Not, um, we, right? we are starting to work with boys. We're just a very small grassroots organization, uh-huh. so. Um, but we work mostly with, we work with girls. I work with girls, uh-huh. and um, and then I think New Friends New Life works with older women too, who have, are trying to get out of the industry, and right. we're working with teens. I so see. both in detention, and then we we provide ways for them to follow up with us. We can't contact them when they're out because they're minors. Mm-hmm. And so, but we give them all kinds of contact, ways to contact us and ask us, ask them please to, you know. To, Stay in touch. Yes, because yeah. we'd love to continue mentoring them on the outside, but they I have see. to initiate So you it. only have access to them while they're mm-hmm. in, in, mm-hmm. in jail, basically? Or? Yes, but the girls we work with and the group I'm with um, are in drug rehab, so we know we're going to have them for about three months. So oh, we wow. get a good – and they really enjoy coming mm-hmm. to us. We're like a reward. So mm-hmm. they um, they tell us, you know, we, we're so excited because y'all are coming tonight, and we really develop a close relationship with them and learn a lot about them and help them. So. Well, for a lot of people, this is just, I mean, th- like I said, I think most people, if they hear human trafficking, they're thinking, you know, Asia or Africa mm-hmm. or something like mm-hmm. that. They don't think about how prevalent this is in the United States. So the natural question is to ask, how prevalent is it in the United States? Obviously, if Dallas has two organizations that are working with this, it, it's it's here. But it, uh, I listened to a, uh, a tape of a broadcast yesterday in, in preparation for this with, that was dealing with um, – with uh, human trafficking in the state of Michigan, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, so so I guess we could say it's it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So the State Department estimates, as you said, three hundred thousand women and children in a year. Mm-hmm. We know from Polaris Project, who is the national trafficking hotline, mm-hmm. that Texas is number two. Is the state that receives the second highest number of calls from that national trafficking hotline. Mm. So we know we're a hub in mm-hmm. the nation for this, as you said. It it does happen everywhere in mm-hmm. every city, uh, big city, small city in our country. and But Texas is a hub, and we believe that's because the access to the interstate system, it's easy to get in and out, mm-hmm. and the access to Mexico and to through Texas. And it's so central that you really can um, – a trafficker can take a girl from the West Coast to East Coast to wherever the demand is in a very quick, efficient way. So is, is California the largest? It is the okay. largest. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I take it New York would be up there it's as up well. It's up there, right. Yeah. Florida. And uh, within Dallas, we mm-hmm. know it's it's a huge issue. I mm-hmm. mean, we the Dallas Women's Foundation did a survey was two years ago ago and they said on any given night there will be between four and seven hundred girls being actively marketed online young girls minor girls we're talking girls 12 to 17 years old Mm. on the internet and so and this is happening right here in our city so this doesn't happen just on the streets correct i mean you know i we anyone who's been around the seminary knows that uh, when I was a student here in the 70s, just a few blocks over on what was Bryan Street, was had a notorious reputation for being one of the most walked streets in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there's been some effort, I think, to clean that up. But still, most people, again, when they think of human trafficking, they're, gonna, they're thinking, oh, well, that's – 
you know, that, that someone walking the streets. We're not talking about just that level of, of contact. Now it's gotten very sophisticated since mm-hmm. the 70s. I mean, now we have such um, access through Internet, whether it's through Backpage or whether it's through other sites, that literally the statistics show you can buy a girl within 90 seconds for $90 mm. in our city. And so it's just extremely prevalent, and it's easy access for those for the Johns who want to buy that. Mm-hmm. Well, let me let me uh, walk through a sample of the experience of one girl that you all have on your on your new friends new life pamphlet here because I think it it kind of gives a sense of kind of what you're dealing with and how long and deep a cycle this is. It says here um, at age seven, Emily's drug and alcohol addicted parents divorced. At age eight, Emily was molested and exposed to pornography by various relatives. At age sixteen. Emily was raped. At age 19, Emily gave birth to her first child. By age, uh, by age 19, Emily had three children and married an abusive, non-working husband. And she entered the sex industry as a means of survival. And this is her own words. My turning point came when I was driving to work again and I just pulled over and asked God to help me and save me from this life. I was exhausted being someone I wasn't meant to be. I wanted to be who I dreamed of as a little girl. I wanted to be a better mother for my boys. I wanted to make them proud. I was disgusted with myself and hated who I was." And then it talks about being introduced to the ministry and feeling liberated, etc. That's not an unusual story, is it? It's not. Unfortunately, that's the common story, Mm -hmm. is that it starts with some type of abuse or trauma within that childhood or that that early um, onset for that girl. And it triggers where she never feels really worthy. She never feels like she can be more than that. And it's a long cycle of abuse. So it's an abuse and, uh, on the other side, if I can say it this way, it's an attempt to survive, isn't it? Right. Very much. They, the, the statistics show over 90% of women, adult mm-hmm. women in the sex industry, s- report wanting out. Mm-hmm. So they, they're desperate to get out. Mm-hmm. But they don't feel like they have hope outside mm-hmm. of that. They don't feel like they can survive outside their trafficker or their pimp support or the work that they're doing. And so that's the – kind of good news that we have to offer is that there is hope, that mm-hmm. there is a way out, that there are resources for women and girls who want to be healed and want to find transformation. And that comes through knowing God and knowing Jesus and His plan and purpose for their lives, but it also comes in very practical ways, as mm-hmm. you said earlier. It comes through education, job training, learning how to get employment, maintain employment, learning how to be a good parent to your children. There is hope outside of that, and that's the message that we want to give. So um, I, I take it that the way you discover this is, is, is it in the midst of these um, contacts that happen when someone's in jail can do they come to you? What's because uh, I'm I'm imagining in the back of my mind that if a girl wants to get out, that one of the things that she might fear is retribution for trying to get out mm-hmm. uh, right. because yeah. this is a means of of commerce for the people who are holding them. Right. Uh, so uh, so how, how exactly how exactly does that work, Linda? I mean, I'm sure you run into this when you when you're ministering to them in the context of the uh, of the jail how do the, how do they how do they contact alert i mean how do these girls get started do the does the jail help with this or how does it work well we have a program there that we go in and mm-hmm. so we meet the girls because we're there doing our weekly um, uh, life life skills class uh-huh. so as girls come out, there's ten girls in a pod. As girls leave, then new girls come in mm-hmm. who are who are needing to go through drug rehab. So that's how we meet them. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem is with the underage girls is lots of times they don't have a safe environment to go home to, mm-hmm. and there aren't very many safe houses um, to for them to go into if they aren't in a good home environment. And so a lot of kids will run away, and mm-hmm. that's how a lot of kids survive is by selling their bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, Pimps look for runaways and throwaways, which are kids that are kind of forced out of their homes or they aren't wanted. So um, that's how we meet them. Um, it, it, a lot of them, too, go into foster care, and they'll run from foster care systems because a lot of the foster care systems, especially for girls who have been incarcerated, um, one girl who had nowhere to go, she said, um, I don't want to go into foster care. The only people that take 
girls like us or people that are doing it for the money and I'll run, I swear I'll run, you know. So mm. then they're just prey on the streets if they do that. Mm -hmm. So um, so there really is a cycle almost that's going on with these girls in terms mm -hmm. of they come to jail, they think their only way out is to go back and take care of themselves mm -hmm. when in fact um, the, the foster care may at least be a means of getting out of the cycle and they don't recognize that. Mm -hmm. how, much, how, much, how much of this is distrust in the sense of I imagine – I'm thinking off the top of my head here, but I imagine if you've been abused most of your life and can't trust the people around you, that there's mm -hmm. a high level of distrust so that the idea of someone really wanting to do something for your good is actually a very hard concept to embrace. Mm -hmm. Is it's it true. is that part of what, what you're also dealing with? In Absolutely. That's That's the – First step is knowing that there is somebody who actually loves you and cares for you and wants to help you and provide for you. And without we, asking for anything. Without back. anything in yeah. return. And yeah. I'm asked that really on a weekly basis is why? You know, we'll help someone with their rent or we'll help someone with their child care or provide the mental health services they need. And they'll say, Why are you doing this? What mm -hmm. what can I do? What why are you doing this? And I get to take a deep breath and say, because he did it for me. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, you know, I have not earned any blessings that I have. I just, by the grace of Jesus, have, you know, been given some opportunities and some blessings, mm -hmm. and he did it for me. And because of that, I do it for you. I'm an agent of his transformation. That's why I'm here. That's why we're able to help you with your rent or give you a grocery card or do the different things you need to to get out and stay out is because there is love and there is respect and there is value and it only comes and flows through his love for me and that flows to you and it's just the most un I, i'm a preacher's kid so i grew up <laughs> of two strikes so here comes a, here, I'm an so the organ is playing and, here and we a go. preacher's kid <laughs> and i never ever thought i would go into ministry i uh -huh. i had no really desire or understanding of how i could mm -hmm. and now every single day i get to live that out mm -hmm. and it's the most powerful experience of my life mm -hmm. to be able to really live out my faith mm -hmm. and be able – not because I've done anything good or can do anything good, but I have opportunities because they will give trust and they will surrender and they will accept the gifts that we're offering to them. And not just as a gift, but take it as a real investment that, mm -hmm. okay, if you're going to help me with my car so then I can get my kids to child care and get to this job and make a you know life, mm -hmm. then I I'm going to prove you right. I'm going to prove that there's something good in me, and I'm going to prove that I can do, you know, some really remarkable things with this passion. I've now, had. how do you how how do people get in contact with new friends and new life? Someone who's in the industry who wants to get out. How do you discover who these people are? So the vast majority of our referrals come with word of mouth. Hmm. So just like that one woman that we helped 16 mm -hmm. years ago, she started telling her friends and mm -hmm. they started coming. The same is true today. So the vast majority of women that come to us are because they heard about it from someone else who started coming, started getting help, started seeing a transformed life. But then there are other ways. Now our program is 100% self-select. Mm -hmm. So we have no part of our program that's court mandated mm -hmm. or you know, we just have found that that's not mm -hmm. really the best use of our resources. But we do reach out with law enforcement to judges, to other social service agencies, through our media, lots of different areas where we can, uh, with other partners that we're working with in the city, to say, here's our resource. Here we are in Loose Derrick Jail just to tell you what's available to you when you get out and mm -hmm. do some outreach like that. Mm -hmm. But the number one key is that they. They have to make that choice, yeah. and they have to make the phone call or go online. And uh, our website's newfriendsnewlife.org, and we get emails, you know, on a daily basis that says, "I want help. I, I think it's time. What do I do?" Mm -hmm. And so we can, once they make that choice, and once they take that step, we've got a 16-year 
you know, plan that we have really worked to to get best practices to help mm. a woman transform her life. But she has to ultimately make that choice and take that step. Now, uh, Linda's working primarily with teenagers, from what I understand. Uh, but you, your ministry, I understand it also works with older women as well. What what right. what what would be the is there an average age that you all? So our adolescent program is 12 to 17. Mm-hmm. The average age there is about 14 years old that we offer sexual abuse recovery to them. That just strikes me as amazing, but go ahead. It I'm is. so young. It is. Yeah. And then uh, our adult program goes from 17 to any age. I mm-hmm. mean, there's no age limit there, but the average age is around 32 years old. Oh. And so our goal there mm-hmm. is to go earlier in the process. Right. So we want to go back and turn off that faucet right. you know, so we don't have the, such long lives of, be, of abuse and trauma. And then at that point, you know, many times there's addiction and other things that go with that criminal and if you've got 32 year olds and I imagine you're working with a lot of women who do have children who are single moms right so 82 percent of ours uh, have children of their own and they're all single moms yeah. so we're working with and with the children it's a unique opportunity because they as we have said have been in very volatile homes mm-hmm. high risk homes of their own and they have only seen men in a negative way mm-hmm well, 50% of our kids are boys mm-hmm. and young men. Right. And all they've seen are negative images of men either coming in to perpetrate on their mom or even law enforcement coming to arrest their mom. Mm-hmm. And so they have a very negative image of, of men and what it mm-hmm. means to be a man. And so for us, a key part in our children's program is to show them what good men look like. And that's mm-hmm. a unique way to volunteer mm-hmm. is to come and play basketball or come and serve food or come and help with homework. But to show these young boys what a good man talks like, acts like, looks like, that he doesn't raise his voice, that he doesn't hit his mom, that he doesn't disrespect women. Mm. And so that's a really important program because this is really the only avenue that they may have the opportunity to see. So how does the support come for uh, for your ministry? I, t- I, I take it you're a nonprofit. We are. And... Uh, um, so are there are there churches that support you, foundations? Where does your support yes. come from? So we are a faith-based 501c3. Mm-hmm. We get our support from many churches, local churches, non-denominational um, across the board. We get our fa- funding from individuals who are extremely generous from several foundations in our city who ha- have this as their mission and their purpose. Mm-hmm. And then we do three fundraisers a year that mm-hmm. we work very hard to do. One is a spring luncheon where we have over a thousand people come and have a luncheon last year we had barbara bush come and speak we had Mm. the attorney general there the first lady was there this coming year we're going to have sally field come and speak Mm. about women and their what that meant in Hollywood, but what mm. it also means in our community. And then we also have a golf tournament where men and women can get together and in a fun afternoon raise some much needed support, but also hear about the mission and why it's important. And then what's just coming up in December is a holiday home tour, mm. which we have four amazing homes in Highland Park and Preston Hollow that, mm. uh, again, ticket holders can come and see the architecture, but always hearing about the mission and hearing why it's important. In all of our events, we talk about a pledge that we ask our supporters to make, and that's a pledge to not buy a commercial sex act Mm -hmm. and to tell people why Mm. you pledge not to do that. Mm. And we think it's really important in our community not just to volunteer and support financially, but also really make that commitment that I'm not going to go to that club and I'm not going to go to the brothel and Mm. I'm not going to go online and buy that young girl. And I'm going to tell my peers and my friends and my coworkers why I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that because she was an abused girl and this is abuse and trauma for her. Mm. And it's not just and it's a modern day form of slavery and it preys on the most vulnerable and it's young girls and so we ask everyone that we meet to make that pledge and to tell people why you did it. Join us next week for part two of the Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well. Love well.